My name is Gabi Mayer and I'm in Modern Languages and I'm so delighted and pleased to welcome Katie Brook uh, this afternoon, who's both a theater director in New York City and currently the director of production at StoryCorps, an oral history project that broadcasts stories weekly on NPR. I think most of us are very familiar with that. Under her leadership story course podcast series honoring the 50th anniversary of Stonewall Uprising was nominated for a Peabody Award in 2019. As a theater director of new experimental plays and performance, Brooke has been making original work collaboratively with her ensemble Televiolet since 2012. Most recently, she directed the, broad, the premiere of Liza Birkenmeyer's Dr. Rice American Beach House at Arts Nova off Broadway. Katie Brooks' work has been presented at various venues in New York City and beyond, including the public theaters under the Radar Festival, the, Prov the Provincetown Tennessee Williams Theater Festival, Prelude NYC, and more. She is a graduate of CMU School of Drama and received her MFA in directing in 2012. Her talk today is entitled Vibrant Storytelling or How to Connect in a Pandemic. Um, again, I'm so excited to have Katie and thanks so much for being with us. Thank you, Gabby. Um, can I take it away? Yes. Is that my cue? Great. <laughs> Great. Um, I feel really lucky to be here. Thank you so much, Jim and Gabby and Rebecca. Um, and uh, before I jump in, I just want to say to everyone who's present, if you're like me, you might have Zoom fatigue. I'm in meetings all day um, on Zoom. And so I invite you to do whatever is going to make you comfortable and be able to listen to me for the next hour. Um, and know that I don't have a deck. There's not gonna be a lot of images. It's gonna mostly be just look like this, me talking, um, plus a few videos, which I will give you plenty of warning. So um, don't feel like you have to keep your eyes focused on the screen, um, whatever works for you in terms of being able to listen and just be here for the next, uh, what, 80 minutes now. Um, okay, so, um, when I was invited uh, to do this talk, which was last winter, I was um, invited to speak with you about storytelling and wellness. Um, and I thought at that time I would pick apart notions of personal wellness versus community wellness. Um, maybe my skepticism about wellness as meaning moral or equally moral or good. Um, the problems and pressures of morality and storytelling for an artist living in the world today, or really any day. Um, and probably the different approaches to truth in storytelling in journalism versus art, because those are the places I spend most of my time. And I will still touch on some of those things. Um, but uh, because they're personal interests of mine always, but uh, the thing that I want to center right now, six months into the pandemic, six months into the greatest economic and civil rights crisis of my lifetime and into an enormous isolation for everyone to some degree or another, is the profound importance of small scale, personal, local, counterculture, live and particularly in person storytelling. Um, and yes, I'm doing it by Zoom, <laughs> um, but that's okay. Um, and I hope this will be a chance for us to all be considering these things. So by way of starting, I wanna tell you a recent um, personal story. Um, on the Friday night before Labor Day, I attended the first live performance that I've been to since um, right before New York City's shelter in place. Um, the week before the New York City shut down, I'd seen live music, I'd been to the theater, and I had taken for granted in the best possible meaning of that phrase that a group of people coming together to do some kind of nonsense was just part of my regular diet, part of what made me healthy. And it was just good timing that I got to attend this show on Labor Day weekend. It was in Pittsburgh at City Theater's new outdoor space, um, which they're cheekily calling a drive-in. Um, it's a, a parking lot um, with a great stage at the Hazelwood Green. Um, and it was the first performance that they had done since March as well. One of my close friends and collaborators, Liza Birkenmeyer, who Gabby actually mentioned in the introduction, um, was the writer of the project. And so she was in town and I just happened to move here for the year to Pittsburgh the week before 
um, this was happening. So it was great timing for me. Um, the show is called Fuck 7th Grade. It's a lesbian coming of age rock musical. Um, and I actually have no particular critical take on it because I couldn't really watch it in the way that I am used to watching performance. Um, what I experienced instead was the joy and relief and excitement of performers and audience getting to come together and do a show, tell a story together, try stuff out, kind of flirt around, dare the audience in a friendly accidental way maybe to wonder what would happen next and ask one of my favorite questions in the theater, wait, did that happen on purpose? Um, so this heavy vibe that I got to spend 90 minutes hanging out in on Friday night felt really vital and it fed me for days after. And that was an incredibly powerful experience for someone who's used to going to the theater all the time. And in this moment in the world, full of death and suffering and isolation, that energy, which I used to just take for granted, really came into focus for me. And so I'm going to call that energy vibrancy, which I want to pose as the more fun, less virtue centric sister of wellness. Um, so vibrancy in storytelling is the subject of this talk. Um, so as Gabby said, I'm a theater director of primarily new plays and devised performance. And I'm also the director of production at StoryCorps. Um, I do stuff in between like more mainstream theater work and more niche audio work. Um, but these different roles have, there are many different you know, nuances to each um, and different priorities. Um, but the thing that they all have in common is story and also the, all, the thing they all have in common is the power of emotion and the relationship between story and emotion. Um, first, I want to talk about StoryCorps' work. So um, StoryCorps was founded by a radio documentarian, Dave Isay, who came up in and made a huge impact on narrator-less radio documentary. Um, StoryCorps pieces that you hear on the radio um, are two to three minutes long. You might have heard it on Morning Edition before, or you might have heard our podcast. Um, they mainline emotion to the listener by way of excellent classic story structure and compelling individuals uh, connecting with one another um, privately and seemingly totally uninhibited. The team of producers um, who I manage um, work on these stories extremely hard and uh, do incredible work. They're incredible craftspeople and journalists with a ton of integrity. integrity. Um, and they're striving to express the thoughts and feelings of the participants, not twist them. But the pieces are, of course, still heavily edited and shaped for the listener. Um, so um, this is not the main focus of the talk, but I, I do want to talk about how we do these stories a little bit, because I think it's something that people are always curious about um, and maybe enlightening to this question of vibrancy. So what happens behind the scenes at StoryCorps is actually the heart of what we do. Um, it's more an oral history project than a radio project um, in terms of the actual resources that we use. Um, and it's, uh, it, it basically, it's a, a way to collect thousands and thousands of stories and put them in the Library of Congress. You can do it as well if you want to. Um, participants come into a recording booth, um, which doesn't feel like most sound booths. It's like a cozy coffee shop or maybe a sacred space if, you're, if, if that's your orientation. Um, and it's a place to sit together with a facilitator who guides but tries to stay out of the way and talk about whatever matters to you for 40 minutes. Um, some of these conversations get turned into radio, but most of them don't. Um, the experience of actually just doing the story court interview um, and having that recording um, with a loved one can be extremely powerful. I've done many of these as a facilitator um, and as a participant, and they continue to be really powerful experiences. Um, one of the essential elements of the experience is the close physical proximity of the participants. And so in March, um, that stopped being an option for us. Um, so both uh, in terms of the radio we needed to put out and then the sort of public service aspect, there was a real emergency to try to figure out what to do um, at that moment. Um, and over the course of the spring, we 
developed a way to record conversations virtually in something that feels like a video conference. Um, it's not quite the same, but in the striving for connection, there's a new vibration that I hear in the tape. Um, and so I'm going to play one of the one of my favorite pieces that um, we did in the spring. Um, I'm playing this for you both because I think it's great and hope you'll enjoy it. Um, and because uh, it, it was one of the first pieces that we recorded. Um, and I think you can really hear that sort of reach between the participants to connect. Um, so uh, I, I'll screen share in just a second, or I'll read, I'm gonna read an intro for you first. So um, the participants are uh, Roberto Vargas, who is the director of microbiology at a hospital in Rochester. Um, and he's talking to his family. He had been running um, COVID tests for uh, two months um, because of the risk of exposure. He'd been isolating himself from his wife, Susan, and their four kids um, for, for the two months leading up to this interview. At first, he'd stayed in a hotel near his job, um, but more recently, he had moved into the basement of their home. Um, so that's where Roberto was when he recorded the remote StoryCorps interview with Susan and their 10-year-old Xavier to talk about what it's like having to keep distance from him even at home. So bear with me as I do the first screen share of this presentation. Um, okay. Someone yell if they can't see this. Great. All right. Um, okay, so this is Roberto Vargas, Xavier Vargas, and Susan Vargas. And it's just short, shy of like three minutes. When I would go to the hotel room after a long day and it was just me there and it was very quiet, that was when I missed you all the most. It got very worrying once I knew the virus was going to be like a big thing. And with you gone, it was way harder. I just missed you. I remember he'd trap groceries off and put them on the front porch. And that's when we started talking through the window next to our front door. You would talk on your cell phone and the kids and I would sit behind the window and I remember one of the hardest nights, oh, I think yeah. you were just exhausted. You just had your head on the window and were crying. But eventually you started sleeping in the basement. And I would not let the kids go past the top of the basement stairs. We had to stay far away. But I just felt better that you could be like a part of us. Mm -hmm. It's still very hard, but it's just nice to see you, Dad. You have been so helpful to Mom. So thank you, okay? Thanks. I remember once you came into the basement, the best night I had yet, you know, your coworker had made all these different dishes for us. <clears throat> you sat at the bottom of the stairs in a rocking chair and I was at the top. I remember that, yes. I even remember the food. It smelled so good. It was the first time we had been able to connect in so long. And as crazy as it sounds, it's the best date I've ever had with you in my life. Without you, I wouldn't have been able to do what I've been able to do at work. You have to be absolutely everything to our four beautiful kids. I've never loved you more, and I know it hasn't been easy. Could you guys turn up to cry? It makes me sad when you cry. <laughs> oh, sorry, honey. These are tears of happiness. Roberto, I admire you so much. Always admired you, but... You've done things these past couple months that seem impossible. What you're doing is a lot harder than what I'm doing. A lot harder. Dad, I just want to say thank you for helping get rid of this virus. That's a team effort and that team includes you. But what carries me through is this family. Okay, so that was... Um, excuse me, that was Roberto Vargas and his, um, his wife Susan and his son Xavier. Um, and I, I share that piece with you again because I think it's, it's a great one, um, but also it does that sort of lightning in a bottle thing that StoryCorps does so well um, and it's so refreshing in the news cycle right now. Um, 
Before I move on, um, I should just plug our recording tool that we've developed. So if you uh, want to record um, a, a story remotely with a loved one, go to the website, storycore.org, and there's a, information about how to do that on StoryCorps Connect. Um, okay, so um, uh, moving on, I, I want to just sort of like pause um, from my my own experience in life just to talk about um, the the name of this lecture um, where I'm using the word vibrant um, and so I just want to acknowledge uh, Jane Bennett's vibrant matter um, so this lecture just to for anyone that knows this book it's not in direct conversation with that book but I did um, look at that book to see if there might be any relevance for me and to make sure that I wasn't expressing a very different meaning of vibrancy. So for those of you who have not heard of this book, um, it made a splash uh, in some academic art circles in the 2010s um, when I was telling a scholar friend of mine about some ideas for this talk, she reminded me of it. Um, and I had read a little bit of it before, um, but I wasn't as familiar as I should be with it. And the subtitle of it is A Political Ecology of Things. So it's a, not a book about people, um, it's a book about things, but humans figure and the way that she describes human bodies as things in the introduction felt really relevant to me when I went back to it. So I'm going to read you a few sentences from her introduction. So this is Jane Bennett. <clears throat> I have been trying to raise the volume on the vitality of materiality per se. Pursuing this task so far by focusing on non-human bodies by, that is, depicting them as actants rather than as objects. But the case for matter as active needs also to readjust the status of human actants not by denying humanity's awesome, awful powers, but by presenting these powers as evidence of our own constitution as vital materiality. In other words, human power is itself a kind of thing power. At one level, this claim is uncontroversial. It's easy to acknowledge that humans are composed of various material parts, the minerality of our bones, the metal of our blood, the electricity of our neurons. But it is more challenging to conceive of these materials as lively and self-organizing rather than as passive of mechanical means under the direction of something non-material that is an active soul or mind. Um, that end part is the part that was extremely helpful to me in terms of thinking about um, vibrancy. Um, I, just to repeat that, that end part, it's um, so thinking of um, the of people not as under the direction of their solar mind, um, but as uh, as material things that are self organized, um, that are that are acting um, without sort of a, a a mind telling them what to do. Um, I found this extremely helpful in talking about vibrancy. Um, I, uh, I I was. Uh, thrown off by the word actant. And um, those of you who are well versed in literary theory or semiotics probably were not bugged by that at all. Um, but I actually had to check it out because I was I was like that actor would be a fine word there. Um, and I'm so I'm just for those of you who got caught up in that word as well. Um, it means something that does something to something else, like plays an active role, usually in a story. Um, my inclination is to say actor, um, but she uses actant um, because of, of course, or the tradition that she's speaking from. Um, so I found this really helpful. Um, and uh, it makes me more able to value um, the experience um, of vibrancy that I have in storytelling, not just as like the extra sizzle of a well-told story, but as actually fundamental to the storyteller and the story themselves. So the experience of that outdoor performance, um, the drive that I've been in uh, as a, to, to, to do these remote recordings of StoryCorps, and um, put them on the air. And this philosophical thinking around vibrancy um, brought some um, clarity to me on how story works um, it, from my point of view. 
it's not so much that I am pro or anti narrative, um, but more that I'm not narrative centric, that I'm um, wanting to get away from that binary in my own mind. I'm more or less energy centric and I glean meaning and am moved by that energy more than anything else. I had trouble making sense of this as anything other than in an opposition. Um, at StoryCorps, also in new play development, there's a lot of talk about the bones and the meat of the story. Um, the bones being the structure and the meat being sort of the dimension, emotion, flourish, etc. Um, this is very common to those of you who have a theater background, I'm sure. Um, and that is helpful, if gruesome as a metaphor, um, for some kinds of storytelling, but it diminishes or confuses storytelling that doesn't obviously show a traditional story structure. And because um, my one true love <laughs> is experimental theater, um, I'm not drawn to the bones and meat metaphor as a default way of thinking about story. Um, so I want to pivot now to um, theater in specific um, with regard to storytelling and vibrancy. I come from downtown theater in New York City. Um, I'm going to give you some history and context for downtown theater right now um, from my own very particular, not at all broad or balanced perspective, um, but hopefully uh, a meaningful one for the purposes of this talk as someone who's been a part of that scene for about 20 years. Um, so downtown theater, um, which is uh, interchangeable sometimes with experimental theater or avant-garde theater, um, it doesn't care too much about story or when it does, story is used as a broader term that refers to like the unfolding of events, cause and effect, or is a thing that is to be complicated or challenged. Um, certainly there are a few exceptions, and I'm sure there are people in this um, lecture right now that are thinking of those exceptions. Um, but because story so often means something hegemonic, um, the Aristotelian story structure of the dominant culture, and is so often tied up in realism, it's not usually a priority in downtown theater, which aims to challenge the ontologies that the mainstream cult culture accepts. Um, and I'm going to propose that vibrancy is, on the other hand, like the currency of downtown theater, because what downtown theater celebrates is liveness. This um, is maybe the case for most uh, experimental performance and um, a lot of performance in general, um, that its power is its ephemeral nature and that ephemerality is how it evades commodification, um, giving it a unique extra value and a sometimes spiritual power um, to be a part of be a part of or to uh, be witness to. Um, poor theater, anti-commercial theater, et cetera. So um, if this sounds elusive or strange to you, just think of a band that you love that you've seen play live and the quality of that experience of the live performance over the recording. So that's it. And it's that times 100 because it's what's centered. Um, there isn't a single um, founder of downtown theater. Um, it has a history of multiple powerful voices and influences um, that I appreciate in many different ways and I'm not going to talk about all of them, but um, for the purposes of this talk, I want to focus on um, one very impactful director, uh, Joseph Chaikin, um, who was most active in the 60s and 70s. Um, and for the purposes of thinking about vibrant storytelling, um, this was where I went um, in, in, in my thinking for this talk. Um, so his company was called The Open Theater. It existed explicitly in opposition to the mainstream commercial theater. Um, and when I think of The Open Theater, I think of like very fit looking performers who have bare feet and raggedy rehearsal clothes and there are no sets and just a few props. Um, it's in the tradition of Grotowski's poor theater, um, which is all about stripping things down to uh, the performer. Um, and this is all for the sake um, in, in Chaikin's view of a focus on presence, um, which is a word that is still used all the time to describe compelling performers, not just in downtown theater. Um, this is a, so this is a quote from Chaikin's book, The Presence of the Actor, um, which I'm just sharing to help explain what, what 
shaken means by presence and and then um, sort of in a way what I mean by presence. Um, so also jo Joseph Chaikin was an actor himself. Okay, so when we as actors are performing, we as persons are also present and the performance is a testimony of ourselves. Each role, each work, each performance changes us as persons, as people is what he means. Um, the, the actor doesn't start out with answers about living, but with wordless questions about experience. Later, as the actor advances in the process of work, the person is transformed. Through the working process, which he himself guides, the actor recreates himself, nothing less. By this, I don't mean that there is no difference between a stage performance and living. I mean that they are absolutely joined. The actor draws from the same source as the person who he, um, who is the actor. And I would argue um, that most traditions of acting are trying to cultivate presence. Um, we so, have does someone want to interject or are they just not mm -hmm. muted? Okay. okay, we can talk more about presence if, if that rubbed anyone in the wrong way at the end of the talk too. Um, so um, so um, the, the thing that Joseph Chaikin was um, trying to do was to center presence, like elevate that and um, make it the focus of his work. And I would say the thing I was going to say before is just that actor training um, often is trying to cultivate presence and isn't always calling it that. Um, and it's also presence in the sort of spiritual meaning that, of course, was probably, um, you know, that moment in the 60s and 70s. I'm sure we could talk about how it was dovetailing with other cultural movements. Um, but it had to do with being in the moment, which is something that actors talk about all the time, too, now. Um, and it makes presence like the seat of vibrancy. Um, presence is also helpful because it's inclusive of non-professional performers and many kinds of performers. Um, and working with amateur performers is like a perennial part of downtown theater's history. Um, it kind of comes in waves. And, um, and I think that that's because it, there's this pursuit of, of presence. Um, I'm going to do my best now to give you some sensibility of downtown theater right now um, and uh, in terms of what I do and maybe where I um, fit within it um, and and how story is, has, is treated and how story ends up yielding to other things. Um, presence is still a thing, um, but so is irony, uh, disconnect. Um, there's a lot of mess, there's a lot of dance, silly amateur dance, often danger, irreverence, um, and a lot of play, uh, I think characterizes um, the downtown theater. So um, I was looking for a video of important work that I wanted to share with you from the last you know, decade or so, and theater um, on video is so hard to translate. Um, but what I did come across that I think is really helpful is a short video, um, from Radio Hole, um, which is sort of the a generation ahead of me, I suppose. Um, and uh, this is a, a, it functions kind of like a little 101 on the ethos of 21st century downtown theater. Um, it's from their piece, Whatever Heaven Allows, um, which actually toured to Pittsburgh. So part of the reason I'm sharing it too is perhaps you might've seen Whatever Heaven Allows when it, when it toured in the, um, maybe 2012 or something like that. Um, okay, so I'm going to screen share um, again to, sh to share this with you guys. All right, so um, all right, so I'm going to go full screen. Someone shout if you can't hear this. Um, so again, this is um, Radio Hole talking about their piece, Whatever Heaven Allows. Um, there you go. Well, it's story time again, Louis. You ready to tell a story? Well, let's act this story out. Like a play. Yes, like a, a, real, a real play. The show is basically a mashup of Whatever Heaven Allows, Paradise Lost, and the sensibilities of all five people engaged in this show. One of the things that makes this company interesting to me is that it is always a group effort. 
Everybody's voice is in the show. I'm gay. I'm gay. What? Get on my me. Tail. I think one of the things that makes it difficult for people to get their head around Radio Hole sometimes is that we allow every voice to come in. We don't streamline it into a narrative and into a coherent idea. Well, hello. Women. Hi. Women. Yes, hello. So in a way, sometimes maybe there's too many ideas going on, but we prefer that to editing it out everybody's voices. Sound, lights, etc. always work by the people on the stage and video. And so the new version of that for this show is using iPhones. It's based on a melodrama, which uh, was a radical... <laughs> The button doesn't work. <laughs> that wasn't me. I'm not touching it. Who's doing it? I have a habit of hitting the buttons at the wrong time. So I am not allowed to wear it during the show. Because I always do that. There tends to be a mess or there tends to be beer. And when you throw jello in your face, you're having a real moment. You can't act that. It's a real thing. It's sort of a way to um, stay grounded and, and not... Pretend. Some people, I think, are very uncomfortable with it in, in different ways. Um, I think some people are intellectually uncomfortable with it. Some people are physically uncomfortable with it. Uh, I would love to have an equity stage manager try to manage this company. It would be so great. All right. So, um, oh God, there's something else. The United States of Anxiety is a show off. about the unfinished Just business of our history and its grip on our future. I have no Underlying idea almost what it is. every cultural divide. Every All right, it's an, it's an ad for something. Excuse me there. Um, okay, I hope you can just hear me now. Can I get a thumbs up? Or, okay, great. <laughs> um, okay, so, um, so, there, so the radio hole video. So there's just this embrace of mess, fun, um, striving and failure. Um, and I'm not playing this video. I, I wasn't playing the video to express that Radio Hole is like the ultimate thing. Um, there are so many artists and companies that hold similar values and make work in similar ways. Um, but I found that video helpful and charming. And, um, and I also personally, I remember seeing a Radio Hole show in the early, uh, 2000s, like 2005, and I remember hating it um, and felt assaulted. And um, I think what Eric Dyer said at the end, something about um, uh, it rubbing people the wrong way intellectually and viscerally, um, that's exactly the experience I had. But um, then over time, I sort of started to love it in retrospect because it really did affect me in a different way than I have ever had in performance. Um, so one of the things that I've explored a lot in my work is emotion. Um, the useful plot furthering kind, um, which is useful as in, in, in the theater, um, and also the kind that isn't useful, that isn't furthering the story. Um, and that's perhaps the more interesting one for me in my explorations. Um, the layer of emotion um, of uh, the, the layer of emotion of the character and the actor and the blurring of those things and the area in between them. Um, we uh, did a project, at my ensemble um, did a project a few years ago that had multiple iterations, but eventually it premiered in 2017 at Abrams Art Center and it was called The Power of Emotion. Um, and I am gonna share some video, some, some theater video from that um, because I do wanna share some of my work with you. Um, it, so this piece used um, a, a German film of the same title, sort of experimental, absurd German film um, called The Power of Emotion. Um, it also used my experience being on a jury of an arson trial. Um, it used Wagner's Ring Cycle, uh, and it featured texts um, by um, my collaborator, Shawnee Enelow, um, and music by Taylor Brook, who is my brother. Um, and it featured uh, a couple of incredible performers and it, a, a new music ensemble. It was sort of an experimental opera uh, music theater work and making it was a lot about tuning our ears to one another and especially for the performers communicating fluently with one another on stage. 
Um, so I'm going to play um, a video. Uh, this is a, it looks like a 10 minute video. I'm going to play like five and a half or six minutes of it um, from the production of The Power of Emotion. And you're going to see performers talk ensemble, um, Katiana Rangel uh, and Lucia Roderick and, um, uh, and just hold please while I screen share. Let's listen to the radio. Or something else? couple, a man and a woman, and they didn't like each other anymore. But then they got involved in selling drugs and other crimes and things, and after that, they started to enjoy each other's company to the fullest. But then one day, they had to kill a man, or they killed a man, but didn't mean to. Then they had to deal with that, because that was a big mess, of course. So. They decided to clean up the scene and smuggle him across the border in the trunk of their car. But when they got to the forest on the other side... And they were stopped by border agents, by government agents at the border? No, they weren't stopped. When they got to the forest? When they got to the forest, they opened the trunk, and there he was, blinking up at them like, what the fuck? Because he was alive. No! Yes, he was alive! So they took him out and brought him to some cabin that they found in the woods revived him with soup and blankets and brought him back to life. And then what happened? Well, it was really iffy, because what were they going to do with this man that they weren't supposed to have killed in the first place? Right. So they decided to kill him again. I went to the bathroom then, but it was more of a choice that time. I mean, it was more of a choice to kill him the second time, so it was better for them psychologically. Okay. This is the one I was on last night. A man and a woman are in love and they're hiding in the woods. They are by a river. It's the fourth hour after midnight. Most of people in the world die at this hour. And he has to leave to go get supplies. So before he leaves, he gives her a ring. It's a powerful ring. Then he goes and meets other people. And he doesn't realize that they want to keep him for themselves. And they drug him and make him have sex with someone else. And he doesn't even realize what he's done. And he joins up with them because the drugs are really good. And then they tell him he has to go get his girlfriend so she can be the girlfriend of one of them. But she resists, and she fights them. Does she know what happened to him? No. But she can sense something. So she fights, but she loses, and they take the ring. And then some other stuff happens, but finally he wakes up from the drugs, and he remembers her. And he remembers that he promised to stand by her, but only after he's been stabbed in the back, like literally, by one of the people in the gang. So he dies. And what does she do? Then she hears the real story. 
and she decides that she has to kill herself too. And everyone gets quiet. And they even let, let her take the ring back. She is in charge now. She's like a big fire in the woods. And rides this way on a horse with everyone watching. If you were a mover and a shaker, and I can tell you are, you really don't want to stay around here. You want a personal trainer to push you around. You want the wind in the trees and the larks in the sunshine. You want a good looking neighbor to watch through the blinds. I've got a feeling about you. You should get on the next bus. One look at you and anyone could tell that you're blurry. Blurry all over, no sharp lines on you. I'm not saying you're fat, you know. I know what I mean. You're indistinct. That's what I'm trying to say. You want closet space to fill up, but you won't fill it up, you know what I mean? I've known people like you before. I met a guy once at a party. He loved suspense. His chest hair grew in a spiral. I took him home, and I guess there was something romantic about it. But that's something I got after, because we took a bath together. While I was doing it, though, everything was cloudy. I felt cloudy. I mean, I didn't have anything to say, and I didn't have anything to feel. Like a sheet pulled over the head made of fog. The night was cloudy, and next morning was cloudy also. Then it occurred to me, he was a cloud. Please be careful with that. Okay, I'm gonna pause it there. Um, okay, great. So that was um, that was from the Power of Emotion at Abrams Art Center in 2017. Um, so this piece uh, uses story, but multiple frequencies of stories that are sort of layered on top of each other. And um, in that uh, in that clip that you just watched, um, there's a scene from the German film, which is expressed um, in some of the text and some of the gesture. The story of the two roommates um, about to burn down their apartment, the, the, which was the, um, the murder arson trial story um, that I was referring to earlier. And that's expressed in the design and some of the dynamics between the performers. And then of course, um, the ring cycle, uh, the immolation at the end of the ring cycle, um, and uh, that's expressed also in some of the music. And then I would say the real actual uh, moment that the real actual performers are living in with this real actual audience. Um, that is the other uh, story frequency. And as a director, the thing that I was tuned to so acutely um, was uh, that vibrancy of the, the performers dealing with um, these various frequencies and with one another. And ultimately, that's what is communicated to the audience on the visceral level more than anything else. Um, so the project that I am sort of in the middle of and paused on right now, um, the a big project with Televiolet is Islander. And just before um, public gatherings were forbidden in New York, I was working on this piece. <clears throat> so I'm not playing video from this. Um, it would be rehearsal video that I that I don't want to share with this large group. Um, but I do want to talk a bit about it um, as it pertains to um, vibrancy and storytelling. So um, Islander is, um, it's sort of an expressionist documentary um, about the identity crisis of straight white men in America today. It's made of real hockey commentary. 
And I'm making it um, with Liza Birkenmeyer, um, who also is a CMU alum, by the way, um, and who I also referred to earlier um, as the, the person who was the writer on that city theater show. Um, we're using all verbatim text, um, mostly from NHL commentary, um, but taking it out of context. And so the new context for this verbatim text is a one man show um, with all the tropes built into that um, that you might associate. Um, and so that's like, that's a funny joke to me. It's, it's a sort of funny, pathetic um, uh, context to put this material in. Um, and also, I realize it's an energy that I found, find really exciting and upsetting to watch. It demands attention. Um, in a one-man show, the performer is saying, yes, you should definitely spend the next hour focused just on me, and, and I will um, look at you the whole time, and you will like it. Um, in Islander, I'm playing with that by having the character who's just called man be exhaustingly and sometimes repulsively self-centered while also appealing to the ingrained misogyny of the audience um, to uh, evoke sympathy and, um, and also it, there's, it's full of humor, of course. Um, when the city uh, shut down, uh, we were scheduled to actually go into tech the following week, meaning we were about to do the production. Um, so stopping at this point in the process was extremely frustrating to all of us. Um, over the past six months, I've been asked by collaborators and friends many times if Islander will change um, media in order to happen right now in this, in this time we're living in. Um, and I refuse to do it with this piece because what I realize when I think about it is that it is trading so much in live performance vibrate, vibrancy just because of the conceit of it as a, this one man show and this interaction with the audience. And I feel sure that mediating it will take the life out of it. So that project will have to wait. Um, there is really interesting storytelling happening right now though. And um, I don't want this whole talk to be a lament. Um, the, of course, the story core that I started off with, um, but in terms of like performed storytelling, there's a lot going on too, and perhaps the, the um, question and answer discussion part of this talk, maybe people could even surface things for each other. Um, even if you aren't on board with like form before style or the medium is the message, um, or some of the, the um, uh, orientations that I am um, sort of talking about in this talk, I think that um, more of us are feeling uh, that the context and the delivery system for storytelling matters more than ever. Um, I want to mention The Moth, um, which is a project that's akin to StoryCorps in some ways um, and that you may have heard of. And um, it's also akin to performance in another. Um, if you've never been to a Moth show and you have a chance to, please go at some point. You may have heard them on the radio um, and you may not have been so sure about it because they're, it, it's, um, it's first person storytelling. People are telling their own stories, um, which is really wonderful. Um, but there's a sort of performativity to it because it's live events um, that are being recorded. Um, recently, they did their first big virtual event in Greenwood Cemetery. I think it was last week I watched it um, live. And it was exciting to watch because, oh, sorry, Greenwood Cemetery is in New York. Um, it's, not in, it's not in Pittsburgh. Um, it's, a, it's a big, very old, important cemetery in New York. And it was an amazing context for this um, for this moth event. Um, it was exciting to watch um, for me, in part because of my memory of, of what being in that live setting is in person. Um, but they did their best to um, really uh, make it come alive. The stories came through and it did feel enriching. Um, it was different certainly from the experience that I have most nights working at home, doing domestic work, watching television, um, even even watching really good television. And there were, because there was something about it being live um, and because it was personal and generous and because the stories were compelling too. Um, the other thing I wanna uh, surface for, um, for this group 
is the work of another alum um, from CMU Drama, um, a good friend of mine, Joshua William Gelb, who's been doing a really exciting project um, since the beginning of um, the, since the shelter in place order in, in New York. Um, he has a little apartment in the East Village and he converted his closet into a little white box in the spring um, and started uh, playing with live video uh, manipulation and has created this tiny little theater that he performs in every few weeks. Um, and they're doing really re remarkable stuff. And I'm going to um, play one more video for you guys, um, which is a, a short piece um, by Josh and Katie Rose McLaughlin, a choreographer. Um, and it's one of the shortest works they've done. It's sort of a study of the emotional state of quarantine um, and a uh, study of this little space. And of course, I'm sharing it with you also because it's um, the sh one of their shorter works. Um, they have longer, um, more elaborate things that I encourage you to check out too. Um, so I'm going to um, screen share again and we'll watch uh, one final video. If I can get out of this video. There we go. Okay, so again, this is um, Theater in Quarantine, um, Joshua William Gelb's project uh, with Katie Rose McLaughlin. Um, and this is a piece that they made um, back in May uh, or maybe April. Um, and this is, so the video we're watching is something that was actually performed live. Um, and uh, let me just go to full screen and play this for you guys.
Okay, so um, of course I've been preferencing live stuff. Obviously, there's so much more out there, and I hope that we can uh, discuss that in in the in the session. Um, just following this, and just to uh, I want to share one other thing um, before I conclude um, my part of this. Um, so I think I referred to um, my ensemble earlier, Televiolet. I named my theater ensemble Televiolet like 10 years ago, um, combining the prefix tele, meaning remote communication, and Violet, um, which is the name of Tennessee Williams' infamous diva Violet Venable from suddenly last summer. And this name at the time was just the best articulation I could come up with for my aesthetic ambitions. I've always had a thing for distance between the audience and the performer, um, less in the Brechtian and alienation way, though that's cool too, um, but more in a romantic striving to communicate impossible feelings within the confines of artifice kind of way. Um, the live performer with live audience is so exciting because of the separation between the two. And I never want to forget that separation. But I see now that that separation is also like a closeness. So I hope that this lecture um, has been a chance uh, to think about the power of live performance, the value of a group gathering together um, to make a story and to share it with an audience. Um, and hopefully an audience who is gathered together um, in person uh, to uh, take the time to receive the story. And when we can't do that, still valuing that vibrancy and seeking it out um, with one another where we can. So those are all of my remarks um, and I would love to transition to a discussion. Okay, thank you so much, Katie, for this great talk. Um, I think it's difficult to clap, so we'll just imagine a lot of clapping right now. And we have quite a bit of time for questions. So I would ask you to raise your hand. As you know, there's the raise your hand function and I will call on you or Katie can actually do this herself. Um, and if you have questions that come up while someone is talking, just put them in the chat and um, we will make sure to get to them. So maybe Katie, if you uh, would like to take questions, I can also help, but since you are the presenter. I'm, I'm happy to. I can't quite tell what a hand raise looks like. So I'm also comfortable with just like turning your mic off. Or raising a hand, whatever people want to do. Or if no one is talking, you can just start. And if, if, if no one has any like direct questions, that is so fine. And, and if you want to share any like anecdotes or just advice on where to um, hear stories right now or watch live experiences, I think that would be very valuable too. So if no one wants to um, say anything, maybe I can um, ask a question. So you've been talking uh, primarily about your um, theater experience and what it means to have vibrancy in your performances. Mm -hmm. um, would you mind maybe um, clarifying if you see a difference between like store core vibrance and the theater? Uh, is that the same or do you feel like there is a um, marked difference between the two? I think in terms of what I, when, sort of trying to think over here, I was actually trying to find similarities or, or um, like, um, I think that, that StoryCorps um, pieces as opposed to theater are so different in a really fundamental way, which is that they're not live, right? But that um, what we are cultivating when we're making those pieces is a sense of liveness that gets like almost as close as you can possibly get to the live experience. Um, and, um, uh, and I think when it's successful, it gives you a sense that you're just like listening in to this, um, this moment. Um, I think the, the big difference um, for me is that, that the, the speakers themselves are not experiencing and kind of getting vibrations back from an audience, which is maybe the, the main way that I experience or think about the difference between those things. Um, and 
Yeah, certainly the, the um, I'm not always kind of trying to find connection between the these different types of work. Um, I do think that live work and um, and not live work is is like apples and oranges in a way. But um, I think right now I'm considering them more maybe more similar or or I'm interested in things that are common to both of them. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Mm -hmm. Anyone have since we don't, I don't see any hands, just go ahead and ask your question or your comment if you have one. Hi, Katie. I have a, I have a comment that I would love to ask. Hi. Um, first of all, thank you so much for sharing. This has been um, extremely thought-provoking and apropos of the time. And, um, and I, it's just giving me a lot to think about, which I really appreciate. Um, my question has to do with um, something that I have work, been working on with regard to narrative, which is, mm -hmm. and you mentioned a bit about this, but the sort of hegemonic nature of narrative mm -hmm. um, and authority. And so um, I attended a conference this summer that was on narrative medicine mm -hmm. and, you know, this idea of who, who gets to t tell the stories and, um, and, and how, do, how do we, if we're collecting stories, um, how can we ethically represent the stories that are told without appropriation. Um, mm -hmm. And so looking at the experimental pieces that you shared, it seems like in a lot of ways, breaking down the, the, the understanding of a very specific type of structure that's linear um, helps in some ways take away that power dynamic that you often see um, in you know, a standard narrative. I'm thinking of, again, like mm -hmm. medical narratives, but um, I just wondered if you if you would speak a bit more on that because I think, oh, um, sure. yeah, I'd love to, I'd love to hear what your thoughts are. Thank you. Yeah, this is something I think about a lot in in many different um, parts of my work. Um, so I think that uh, a lot of a lot of companies, a lot of artists working in this mode um, are interested in um, multiple voices. And, multiple collaborators working on a thing, devising a thing for the very reason you're describing. Like that, that's, that's part of that um, effort is to like break away. Um, and, um, and I think that like uh, connected, although maybe it sounds opposite, there's a um, real like um, uh, excitement about just like appropriating like crazy in, in, in downtown theater um, in sort of explicit ways, maybe to like show the, the appropriation. And, and I mean that, I mean the appropriation like lowercase a or whatever, not, not, not cultural appropriation in the, in the sort of dubious way we usually mean it, but like the taking of things from many different places and putting them together and using that as a way to um, uh, explore and kind of like undermine story and 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 um, hopefully sort of tell a story that has to that has to do with the telling of the story um, and uh, and then I see I guess I sort of want to answer this from the the story core perspective too which is a slightly more like um, I don't know maybe slightly more earnest perspective which is that like StoryCorps' mission is to, um, to collect and share the voices of this entire country in whatever way they possibly can, and, and doing that in a way that um, really represents all the people who are sharing their, their voices. And it is an ongoing um, struggle um, uh, because, of course, you know, you can, you can, invite people to into a recording booth and say talk about whatever you want to talk about um but then when you're cutting it into a narrative for radio you're doing it with some kind of audience in mind right and so i think that this is an impossible problem i i, I say this to not to um put story core down in any way i i feel like the producers um working on these stories are always having to reflect on their own um, biases and interests and the and the sort of imagined audience um, to try to communicate a story 
And I, I don't have an answer to that, but it, it's like, it's like a thing that we're kind of like constantly thinking about because of course, like the, the filter of, of the radio producer, not just in story before, like we can talk about other documentary too, like that filter is necessary in terms of shaping it in a way that a listener can receive and having it really reach a wider audience. Like I actually believe that, but um, there is some loss along the way. Like there is something I think that always is um, in some way, um, you know, filtered or diminished or whatever. And I just, I guess I think of it as like an impossible struggle that's really important to keep struggling through. We have more questions, comments. Sure, I'll ask a question. Um, Katie, you had said the project you were working on, you there, it, it wasn't, you stopped working on it mm -hmm. and, and you weren't going to do it in any other form. You yeah. didn't really say why. I mean, it's so, yeah. it, my understanding was it, it uses, um, dialogue from sportscasters so it seems like the kind of thing really appropriate for s uh, sports casting but is there something yeah. about it that requires requires it to be in the mm -hmm. form of it yeah i think so i mean the um so so all of it because all of the text in islander is sportscasters um and we were trying to change the context of it really radically. We wanted to take it away from that context and put it in this. So just to be more explicit, it's like there's a guy who is speaking all of this um, sports commentary in a first person narrative. So he's talking about himself and it's in a sort of, it's like, a, it's like just like the worst thing you could imagine as a one man show. And, and, um, and so there's this dynamic of him interacting directly with the audience and being in that live space um, that is sort of like engaging this kind of um, uh, like pathos and discomfort that, um, that I think when, when, when you put it back, if you were to um, mediate it, either it loses anything that makes it interesting and it just becomes really dull, um, which is part, I suppose, partially a fear, but also it takes the, the um, it changes the meaning back to the original meaning and makes it perhaps like more slick or more distanced or um, something like that. So it's, it's like it, the, I think the reason I wanted to speak about it here is because um, when we lost that context for it, I realized that like that was the value of that or is the value of that work, is that it, that audience performer relationship. Whereas other work of mine, I might be happy to make an attempt at, you know, changing the medium for it. Um, there's a question in the chat. Um, is there anything now that you're working on or thinking about doing for virtual theater? And if, if so, what's the process been like? Thanks. Um, yeah, <laughs> there are a couple of things. I, so I'll, I have two very different answers. Um, um, one is, one is something that is like, I can't seem to get off the ground with this collaborator friend of mine. I, and it's and I love it and it's like all about being a um, parent trying to work and it's a series of of um, of zoom calls uh, and everything I say about it right now is going to sound so terrible um, so I'm not going to try to sell it to you in any way but we we were basically trying to like um, like really lean in to the this way that we're all having to communicate right now and dealing with our lives um, it, th so that process has been really sort of funny and frustrating and, 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 um, uh, terrible. Hi, speaking of which, <laughs> a little one. <laughs> no, it's great. It's great. You're like right on time with what I was just talking about. Um, anyway, that project, uh, is, um, 
it's actually using Vir Virginia Woolf's A Room of One's Own um, to uh, talk about like parenting in this time. Uh, and it's, it's, it's dumb and I hope it goes somewhere, but I, I clearly, I don't even have the words to talk about it. Um, but so yeah, I've tried, I've been trying to work on something. Um, then, then like the, the more sort of like successful thing that I've been working on um, is actually not a live thing at all. It is a, um, a, a narrative podcast. It's like a fiction podcast. And um, honestly, it's something that I had been um, starting to, to think about working on like last year and, and didn't have the opportunity. And then just because of circumstances now, this seemed like a great moment to do it. Um, and so that's something I'm really excited about. We're going to um, start doing recording more soon. You can listen to the pilot if you want. It's called the MS Phoenix Rising. Um, it's a comedy about um, the cruise ship industry trying to relaunch um, after the pandemic. And um, yeah, so that's been very, very um, positive and, 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 and just like a fun thing for me to be working on. Um, um, but it, it's not really engaging with maybe the thing we're talking about um, here. It's, uh, it's, not, it's not trying to meet the challenges of like a live virtual event. And then most of my time has been spent um, dealing with how to do StoryCorps virtually. <laughs> Question. Yes. When Jim uh, talked about the difference, you know, between it, it, about you not wanting to make that one man show, not wanting to kind of put it on screen, surely one of the, the main points there is that uh, if it's on screen, I can switch him off, you know. Mm -hmm, if, that's if, true. If I'm in the theater and this yeah, guy is on my nerves. Uh, and I'm in the front row. It's very hard oh. to escape from that. So, do do you actually believe in punishing an audience? Mm, 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 no, I I mean what you just described. I was I was with you and enjoying the sound of that feeling until you said it punishing. I mean I think that like no, but I but I am I am interested in like writing that line of um, uh, of. Uh, sort of being being both drawn in and uncomfortable um and and i think that like one of the things that it maybe one of the reasons i'm engaged with the one man show trope is because it um it makes the, it sort of kind of like grabs the audience and makes them stick with you um but uh no i mean like i wouldn't i i wouldn't be I'm not interested in like suffering an audience for an hour of that experience. Um, but that piece is, I think you, you, you spend a good many minutes in that experience of like, well, I don't want to be here. Why am I here? And then hopefully kind of like actually engaging with it and, and, um, uh, and not being punished because I'm, I mean, I think that I, I think that that's, actually an interesting thing to think about and I I think that like there's a lot of value in Arto and a lot of the artists like Radio Hole is a great example of a company that sometimes deliberately tries to torture an audience um so I think it's it's fascinating but it's not my inclination to stay in in that for a whole show maybe maybe a, a word to use would be test an audience or challenge an audience mm, that's like, better yeah break with the conventions in the way that you're describing um, some people are going to react to that in a, in a uh, uh, with annoyance or even anger. Yeah, yeah. Do you do you know the uh, British strip Force Entertainment? Yeah, I love Force Entertainment. They do that deliberately. They yeah, be insane. Yeah, and their name is Force yeah, Entertainment. Anyway. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Thank you. Um, okay, there's, I see a question in the chat. Um, uh, a question as someone who advises students pursuing journalism. From what you're exploring here with ideas of presence, are there things that journalism students should be thinking about in terms of how to be relevant and have impact in a COVID or post COVID world? Things that they might not have thought to study before. What can we learn about this virtual moment to bring new vibrancy to journalistic genres and stories? I don't think I have a, 
a straight answer for this question, but I think it's a really important thing to be considering as, as journalists right now, as journalism students. I think that um, this may not be answered with, uh, with my sort of expertise as, as a story core person, but um, I think that um, the news cycle is particularly punishing right now and people are particularly anxious I think that's easy to say. And so making making space for um, story that doesn't seem to have sort of a direct um, reason or, or news peg or whatever is really important and really hard to do. Um, so I think like sharpening your skills in that way, um, like, you know, really thinking about crafting a story learning about traditional story structure. I think that like that's extremely valuable. I don't want to put it down as like this dirty thing. I think it's like for a journalist, uh, for an artist, I think it's actually really valuable to learn. It's, it's um, really uh, manipulative and powerful in really helpful ways. Um, and so I guess that's, that's one thing I would advise. Um, I think that um, that learning about um, also interviewing skills and how to facilitate interviews remotely is really important right now. I think that like the in-person touch that I know a lot of our producers have is just like, you know, they can't do it. And so the, like having to deal with people remotely is challenging, but I don't know that I have like really direct wisdom on that, but just more like that, that has to be something that people that journalists are up for right now. Um, yeah, I wish I could speak more to that. I mean, I'm, I'm happy to to like answer more questions about StoryCorps and journalism too. Um, but I got to thank you. So that's good. <laughs> Let's share that advice with your students. Thank you. Um, I'm one of, uh, oh, this is someone from South Korea. Um, this really helps. I'm just seeing if there's a question in here. Um, I'm just going to read it out loud because I because so you don't have to just wait. Um, many artists and staff um, in here also are dealing with um, hard circumstances. Um, although this horrible, this is a horrible pandemic. We are trying to meet audience in many different ways, like online theater, outdoor performance, etc. Um, I believe we can overcome the situation together. Um, it's 7 a.m. here <laughs> and she has to go practice for an opera. Oh, if you're still online, um, Yu Yen Kim, um, please tell us where we should watch really good uh, South Korean online theater. Send a link or something. Before we wrap up, if anyone has been shy and just has like good ideas for like virtual live work to see right now, please send them in the chat or speak them. I think it's. Um, there's got to be more than the stuff I surfaced. Gabby, Gabby had to, oh, as we all saw, Gabby had a child run in the room and had to leave. So I'm going to take over duties of thanking Katie right. for, for being here and sharing. Oh, wait, wait, there's one thing in the chat I just have to say. Deb Margolin, who is an amazing solo performer, is doing some great solo performances. Okay, great. Thank you, everyone. Deb Margolin. Okay. Sorry, go ahead, Jenny. Christine and Wendy brought Deb Margolian in um, a few years ago, so. Oh, she's great. Mm -hmm. Amazing evening. So uh, thank you, thank you, Katie, for, for being here and for sharing all your, uh, your expertise. And um, it was great having you. And, and there thank would normally you. be applause here. If people want to um, unmute themselves and applaud, that might <laughs> no, be. Uh, yeah, thank you. Thank, thank you. you so much for having me.